Welcome back. This lecture is the first we're going to do on human computer interfaces. And it's about a guy named Douglas Engelbart and what we come to be, what's come to be known as the mother of all demos. Now, what do we mean by human computer interfaces? It's a mouthful of a phrase for a very important and somewhat simple concept. And it's simply, how do we connect to our computers? How do we interact with our computers? How do we get our computers to understand what we want and for us to understand what the computer is putting out? That's the interface. It's how we relate to or connect to our machines. Now, in the beginning, there weren't very good ones. In the beginning, there was a command line. And boy, that was a really bad human computer interface. You had to learn different ways to give instructions every time a prompt came up. You had to speak in the language of the computer. And eventually, we get to a really good human computer interfaces where it's pretty intuitive how we're going to react and uh, interact with our machine. So how do we get from here, from the command line and bad human computer interfaces to the ones we have today? And how do we imagine the ones we're going to have in the future? Well, part of it comes from video games like at the uh, MIT Tech Model Railroad Club, where they do space wars. And they come up with things like remote controls and ways to point at the screen. More importantly, there was the air defense systems that were being developed in the late 1940s and 1950s. And those used graphical user interfaces. So a guy, somebody sitting at a computer, a military officer could intuitively tell the difference, say, between a passenger plane and a missile. That's quite important if you're doing an air defense system. And they found ways for the people looking at the computers to interact with it, such as this guy here who's using a light pen. So those were the early days of human computer interfaces. But the way we get to the ones we have today is because of a guy named Doug Engelbart. And Doug Engelbart joined the Navy right at the end of World War II from San Francisco. And uh, in fact, just as he's getting on the boat and they're sailing out of San Francisco Harbor, the announcement comes that World War II has ended. And so all the sailors yell, turn back the ship, let's go back, go back to port. But no, they continued on and Doug Engelbart got stationed in a naval base in the South Pacific. Uh, but without a war to fight, he spent most of his time in the naval base library reading magazines. And one of them had, in the late 1940s, an important article by Vannevar Bush. Vannevar Bush is an incredibly important person in the history of the digital revolution and all of science uh, in the modern age. He was in charge of scientific research for the government during World War II, thus overseeing the atom bomb project and lasers and radar. He also was a dean at MIT and helped found Raytheon. And he writes an article for the Atlantic Monthly called As We May Think. It was also excerpted in Time Magazine and in Life Magazine. And there's Doug Engelbart in the library, in the naval base, in the South Pacific. And he becomes mesmerized by the vision that Vannevar Bush comes up with. There's the drawing of it. Vannevar Bush says, we will soon have devices. And this is before computers were really all that public. This is like 1945, 1946, ENIAC hasn't been unveiled. Of course, Vannevar Bush knew about it because he was partly funding it. But Vannevar Bush comes up with this concept of a memory and uh, intelligent augmentation tool that's like a personal computer. You can enter, enter, enter information into it. It will store it. You'll be able to retrieve information. You'll be able to type into it. And that's the drawing of what he had in mind. It was sort of like an electronic filing cabinet, but it had many qualities that make it the sort of concept of what eventually would become the personal computer, where you could use a computer to store all your personal information and interact with it. So Doug Engelbart reads about this, and he decides it's his life 
mission. And he comes up in the mid 1960s with all sorts of, of ways that we can implement that vision of human computer interface and a computer that will be a personal assistant to you. And uh, among the things that he conceives of and what he calls his online system is on-screen graphics, multiple windows like we have on our computer screens, digital publishing, blogs, uh, collaboration tools like Wikipedia is, journals, um, email was one of the big things that is part of his system, instant messaging, even hypertext like you do in the World Wide Web to link around things, video conferencing like Skype and Zoom, formatting of documents, all of this becomes part of the concept that Doug Engelbart comes up with in the late 1960s to say, here's how a computer can connect with and augment a human brain. He even comes up with the best input device. As I said, back the military was using light pens, there were different ways to try to connect you physically to the computer screen. I mean, people were trying it with a stylus or people were trying it with a joystick or a light pen. And there was even a device that they had used where you moved your knee and would move a cursor on the screen. Doug Engelbart tested all these things out, figured out what qualities you need. And he comes up with something pretty simple, but boy, it's really important. It's the mouse. In fact, here I am using the mouse to move my cursor around totally intuitively. I don't even need to look at it. And there's Doug Engelbart holding the mouse. And here's the first mouse that he developed. All of this was part of a way to have humans and computers connect more seamlessly, human computer interfaces. And he showed it all off in December of 1968 in what's called the mother of all demos. And it's sort of done on this big screen in front of an audience from two different sites. And he talks about how you can type things in and, and cut and paste and edit your words. His wife calls up and gives him a, sh a grocery shopping list. And he types it up for the demo and then moves the things around on it, adds things to it. And it's really this whole system of being able to create documents, collaborate, share with other people. In fact, uh, he's sharing it in real time with the people down near Stanford. He's doing the demo in San Francisco and they show the screens in both places where they can all collaborate on documents. One uh, interesting thing is that guy holding the camera right in the middle, that's Stuart Brand. I've talked about him some, you'll probably hear a lot about him. He's this puckish character that in five or six decades of the digital revolution, pipes up each decade with some new idea. He's the one who created the whole Earth Catalog, the online service called The Well, and here he is producing the mother of all demos. One of the people who went to the mother of all demos was a young student from the University of Utah. As I said, Utah had a great graphical uh, depart, computer graphics department. Uh, that's where Nolan Bushnell was when he helped uh, create uh, uh, computer space war and uh, Pong. That's where Ivan Sutherland was. And that's where this young guy, Alan Kay, was, who was very sick the day of the mother of all demos. But he still forced himself out of bed to get down to San Francisco because he knew it was going to be a big deal. Alan Kay will go on. We'll hear about him in the next lecture. He's the one who creates the graphical user interfaces at Xerox PARC that became Apple computer interfaces and then Microsoft Windows. Uh, he's sort of the guru at Xerox PARC on how are we gonna do great interfaces. And uh, after seeing the mother of all demos, he says a quote that's certainly true, which is, I don't know what Silicon Valley will do when it runs out of Doug's ideas. So the whole point of what Doug Engelbart did was find ways that connect us to our computers more intimately so that our computers will not be some artificial intelligence that will act without us, but instead they'll augment human intelligence. 
and it'll work both ways. The computer will augment our capabilities, but we as humans will connect with the computer and we'll add our creativity, our insight, the type of things that the human mind does best. And uh, it leads to his quote, which is sort of the, I'll call it the maxim of the digital age that I believe in, which is, it's not about artificial intelligence. It's about augmented intelligence, connecting humans to computers. And that's what human computer interfaces are all about. The phrase Doug Engelbart used for this partnership or symbiosis was augmented intelligence. And as he put it, technology should not aim to replace humans, rather it should aim to amplify human capabilities. Next time, we'll talk about Alan Kay. Thanks.